10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. This is a part of London that seems to breed ghost stories. In the days of Judge Jeffreys, felons were hanged along the river bank, along here. And the shade of the judge himself is supposed to haunt the pub, just along there. Many of the smaller dockyards were filled with the corpses of people who died during the plague. But the wickedest thoroughfare in London was the Ratcliffe Highway. It was there that John Williams murdered two entire families with a mallet. He was buried at the Cannon Street crossroads with a stake through his heart, and the ghost is still supposed to haunt the site of the grave. There's another ghost story that's told about this area. It takes place in the Ratcliffe Wharf, and it was written about by Frank Smythe in one of the last issues of Man, Myth and Magic. In the early 70s, quite a few journalists found themselves with a new market. The current boom in the occult was just beginning, and newspaper surveys suggested that a surprising number of people studied their horoscopes every day and claimed to believe in ghosts. New magazines began to appear, and Frank Smythe covered every kind of subject from black magic to table turning. But his main interest is in folklore, especially in the legends and superstitions of London itself. We're a mile down river from the Tower of London, in a place called Wapping New Stairs, which is the home of London's river police. Part of the fairly unpleasant duties of digging bodies out of the foreshore of this stretch of river. And 200 years ago, their predecessors had even more of this unpleasant work to do, because just down the stream there is Ratcliffe Dock, which was the scene of the activities of a very strange vicar indeed. Years later, people in this area said they've seen the ghost of this evil vicar. As late as 1971, three workmen working on a dock saw him one Sunday morning, and there have been several sightings since. It seems that the man is doomed to wander for his crimes forever along the whopping waterfront. In the 18th century, Ocean-going ships sailed right up to the Pool of London to land their cargoes and pay off their crews. So the inns and brothels of Wapping did a thriving trade, and there were easy pickings for scavengers and crooks. According to Frank Smythe, these included the Vicar of St Anne's, Limehouse.
Have I done well? You have done very well. And everything has been accounted for. Shall we work again tonight? If it is God's will, Nell. If it is God's will. At what hour is the evening tide, Parson? Ah, I shall be at Evensong, at my devotions. And I shall be at mine. So, here we are, you two. <laughs> Prepare for boarding. <laughs> Come on, girl. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> He's a pretty fellow you have here. Your brother. Long lost cousin. Surely not the Admiral himself. But yes, it's Admiral Jack of Walking. Oh, then the Admiral will be buying us all a cherry wine. Oh, yeah, I mean, well, it's a pleasure to serve you. <laughs> Well, if this is your fashion to rub me, such a fashion I never abide. So don't show the change of my guinea, or else I'll give you a broadside. Well, a gold watch hung over the mantel, so the change of my guinea I take. And down the stairs I run nimbly, saying, damn my own. Even an admiral must look after his riches.
The essentials of this story, its characters and its atmosphere, obviously fit very well into the sinister history of London Riverside. Whatever its origins, it soon became a part of local folklore. Well, in fact, the whole thing, the vicar and the witnesses, was a complete fabrication. Um, in 1971, I was working on the part work Man, Myth and Magic, and I'd investigated various so-called real ghost stories and found that the sources were very uh, dubious, to say the least. And I decided to invent one to see how far I could carry the deception, see what had happened. Um, I needed basically a site, I needed witnesses, um, and an authentic story, a sort of background to the whole thing and my friend John was working on the Regent's Canal dock at the time in a particular place called Ratcliffe Wharf. That's right, uh, I had a small job down there uh, converting a railway arch into a warehouse. Uh, it was the ideal setting for a ghost story, we were all rather bored, mm. the job wasn't very interesting you, with your fertile imagination, decided to invent this ghost. I first felt that it, because of the proximity of the Thames, the ghost ought to be a seaman. But John, I think it's, you suggested it ought to be a vicar because it was a Sunday morning. That's right, I said it was Sunday and it would be... It was Sunday morning. It'd be good yeah. if it was a vicar. And then we thought about it and we realised that it was near Ratcliffe Highway, which is a no notorious haunt of boozy sailors, uh, full of brothels and grog shops in the 18th century. And we felt that this fellow perhaps ran a boarding house for seamen, uh, bashed them on the head, pinched the money, threw them into the Thames. And there the story was, virtually. Born of an experiment, and a shortage of coffee perhaps, and a Sunday morning in the local. So the seeds were sown, and before long, they began to germinate. 
Naturally enough, the first results came to light in another pub and were reported by the landlady. Well, it's a very old neighbourhood. Uh, the pub you're standing in at the moment was first built in 1468. And of course, there's bound to be um, lots of spirits from the past here. Uh, they tell about this vicar that walks around the area. And he likes ladies. He follows the ladies around and um, sees what's going on in the pub. And I, I think perhaps that he may be rather um, licentious old devil, you know, that, that is probably why, because he comes into the bedroom, you know, or in the bathroom, where, and this is quite true, you know, he's, he's, you know, you have a weird feeling as though someone's watching you when you're undressing. The landlord's daughter, married to an American, had an even more unnerving experience. Well, she came over here on holiday from Kentucky. She was here for a week or two. And she had a lot of trouble with the youngest child. And uh, the child kept saying that that man wouldn't let her sleep. And uh, she, he was playing up quite a bit. So she decided to go in the bedroom with him on a particular night. And she saw the, the, this person come into the room. And he was dressed in clerical clothes and uh, never said a word, and she went up to get up from the bed to see exactly what he was doing or what have you. Uh, that happened on the, about the third night she was here, third or fourth night she was here, and uh, she asked the child, who was two, two years of age, what's his trouble, why are you crying? He said, that man, and he pointed to the person concerned, he said, that man, that man, I don't like that man, I don't like that man. And uh, she hadn't seen him at that time. But the following night, apparently, she did see the person concerned, and the boy started screaming. A boy of two year old started screaming. Well, she was able to compose herself. She knew it was a ghost. She knew it was a ghost of someone. Reports of London hauntings bring ghost hunters to the Tower of London, to St. Bartholomew's Hospital, and right down to Greenwich. For Andrew Green, the author of Our Haunted Kingdom, a ghost story can only become a case history when it's supported either by the evidence of his own electronic equipment or by first-hand reports from eyewitnesses. Well, I was researching for this book and I got in contact with a gentleman who is running a tour company of London. Uh, he goes around the city and he goes to various places of interest in the city of London and in the Corporation of London throughout London. And he told me, his executor and director of the company involved, and he told me that June 1971, I think it was, one Sunday evening, he had seen a ghost of the vicar of Radcliffe Wharf. And he then told me about this story of the vicar in about 1820, who used to run uh, an accommodation boarding house for sailors and would use them to hit them on the head and throw them into the river. And the ghost had been seen once or twice, usually about June or July, and he claimed that he had seen this figure in Ratcliffe Hall. Charles Lewis, who was a freelance journalist, came across the story when he was working on quite a different assignment. Well, I was doing a story down at um, St Catherine's Dock when they were converting the Telford warehouse. I went down, met these two guys in the, in the pub, and they started telling me this story about this ghost, this vicar. It rang a bell slightly. I was a little bit skeptical about uh, ghosts, because I've done a few ghost stories. And I said, what exactly did you, you see? And they claimed it was just a, two or three days before, and they'd be walking down some street in Wapping. They'd arrived early for work, and they were going to get their breakfast. It was about 7.30 in the morning, and they're walking down the street. Around the corner came this chap, who appeared to look like a priest. He has a white um, shirt with four sleeves and a cloak and a, a collar. And he's quite old. He's quite elderly, with long hair. And one, one of them said, and when he went past, when he went past me, I turned round 
And I looked up the street, and the guy had, this bloke had disappeared. When Jilly Cooper came to Wapping, she was simply gathering material for her weekly column. Well, I, I came down here um, last summer to do a piece on the River Police for the Sunday Times. And they took me out on their launch, and we were going on a trip from um, Greenwich to down to the Tower. And it was a beautiful day, you know, and everything was very sparkling and lovely. And suddenly we were coming down there, and we went past the place, and I said, that looks interesting. Has anything ever happened there? And they said, that's Ratcliffe Wharf. I said, is there anything interesting about it? And they said, yes, well, actually, it's haunted. So sort of being a journalist, I pricked up my ears like mad. And I said, you know, in, in, in what way is it haunted? And they said, well, n n we won't go in at night unless we go in twos. And these were two very, very solid policemen. And they said, dockers won't go near it, lightermen or people who are you know, manning the boats or working around here. And I, and I said, why not? He said, well, it sounds a bit silly, you know, but there's, it's supposed to be haunted by an old 18th century vicar who um, had a boarding house, which he used to sort of lure seamen. He had this very sexy girl who it was sort of parlor maid come, what's it? And she used to sort of lure the seamen um, into, into the building. And then the vicar would give them some dinner. And then when they were all sort of merry and happy, he'd bonk them on the head, tie them up and rob them. And they were usually off the boats, and so they were fairly rich by then. And then he'd throw them into the water. And, and um, you know, this, he did this so often, and evidently he's seen to appear around here quite often. In the five years since the story was published, at least eight people claimed to have seen a ghost that was even less substantial than most of its kind. Which just goes to show that you shouldn't, shouldn't tell lies because they have an unpleasant way of coming true. But if the homicidal clergyman didn't exist, then just who or what did all those people see? Of course, it's possible that their accounts may have been invention too. But if even one of them really saw the vicar, then what triggered the hallucination? In my opinion, it was a combination of local folklore and the power of suggestion. The fact is that the evidence of our senses is not as reliable as most of us would like to think. It's not only insanity and drink and drugs that can produce hallucinations. Long bouts of insomnia, even isolation, have the same effect. But these are random hallucinations. There's only one way in which we can be made to hallucinate to order, so to speak, and that's by hypnotism. We decided to round off our investigation of this ghost that never was by trying to conjure it up once again under hypnosis. Our volunteers were vetted and tested by Dr. Ian Fletcher, who selected two subjects for our experiments. Jeanette Obstoy, the first volunteer, knew already that she was a deep trance subject. I'm going to show you a ring, and I want you to concentrate on this ring, and I'm going to count up to ten. When I reach five, just close your eyes and listen to me all the time and just relax. And as I go on counting, so you will feel yourself going deeper and deeper into a very comfortable and relaxed condition. Just relax now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Just relax completely now. Relax completely. Joan Morgan, our second subject, has had some experience of hypnotherapy. Just relax, just relax completely. Just relax completely. Relax now. You're very comfortable, very relaxed. There's nothing to worry about at all. I'm just going to lift up your right arm. Now I want you to clench your fist just clench your fist tight, 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 tight. Your whole arm is fixed and rigid now. Fixed and rigid, fixed and rigid, and you cannot move it. It's fixed and rigid. There's nothing to worry about, but you cannot move it. Now, the moment I touch your wrist, 
Your arm will relax and you'll relax and go even deeper. Relax, relax, down, down, down. A little later on, we're going out on a location scene and at a certain point, you will see an elderly man with shoulder length, straggly gray hair. He's clean shaven. He's got a hook nose, a very deeply lined face. He'll be wearing a black sleeveless coat over a white shirt. The sleeves are quite full and they're gathered in at the wrists. He's wearing clerical bands white tabs at his throat. He's also wearing black knee breeches, gaiters, and black shoes with bright silver buckles. Now remember, an elderly man, deeply lined face with a hooked nose, and you will see him quite clearly, quite clearly. And suddenly, he will disappear. You will think this is rather remarkable. So remarkable, it won't worry you, but it could be remarkable. You will see Colin Wilson a moment later, and you will describe exactly what you've seen. You will describe the man in detail to him. Now, you will not remember my telling you about this, but you will act upon it. Now, there's nothing to worry about. That's all there is to it. I'm going to wake you up to the count of three. I'm going to count now and you're going to wake up. You'll feel fine, perfectly normal when you wake up. Now, one, two, three. Just wake up. Feel fine now. All right? All over now? No worries. All right? Good. Both our subjects were woken up from their hypnotic sleep, and it now remained to discover if the post-hypnotic suggestion was going to work. They'd been programmed by Dr. Fletcher to forget that he'd given them specific and detailed instructions under hypnosis. Nevertheless, these instructions should take effect. Come up here, shall we? Now, if you just walk slightly ahead of me, uh, and another three or four steps, and what I told you earlier will all come back to you. Now. presence, but I'm not seeing it as clearly as I'm seeing anybody else. I, in fact, started to be aware of a presence a while ago when I was still in the car. I thought that there was somebody looking out of the window in that building. Yes. Um, I didn't get a chance to see who it was. And then as everybody came towards me, I felt that I could see the person that you described, but I, I wasn't seeing it as clearly as I'm seeing everything else. No. But I definitely did see something, and I was very surprised because having, having remembered the suggestion and knowing that it was there in my head, I didn't really think that I would be aware of anything. But it's definitely there. But I, I find I can reason with it. I mean, it's an impression. You can actually see it is somebody, an though. Impression, yes. Oh, yes. Um, and I can feel a presence. But I don't know whether it's just that. I think I'm getting a feeling about the place as well, which I normally do when I come to a new place. Yes. But there's something strange about that building. Here. I don't know what it is. Anyhow, as far as any hypnotic suggestion is concerned, you're released completely from that now. Okay. So. Fine. And you feel all right now? Yes, I feel terrific. Oh, fine. That's fine. Thank you very much. Neither Jeanette nor Joan had been told anything about the experiment, except that it concerned suggestion. 
They didn't even know where it would take place. All their information came from Dr. Fletcher's instructions under hypnosis. But it seemed that Jeanette had not really been under deeply enough. She had a conscious memory of those instructions, so anything she'd seen might well have been prompted by that. We tried again with our second subject. Now, shall we just walk along up here? Yeah. Now, I'd like you to just walk a little ahead of me. Mm -hmm. And just as you go past those trees, yeah. there'll be the impression of what I told you earlier. Oh. Colin? Yes, sir. Do you see that man? Where? What, can you tell me what you saw? Oh, um, well, you look like a... No, it couldn't have been. What did he look like? Sort of white, straggly hair. He looked like Fabian. He had a quick, big hook nose. Um, what was he dressed like? Oh, in black, sort of thing. This, his trousers didn't come all the way down. He had like a woman's blouse on, you know. All this thing. Oh, what, a, what about his shirt? His... He had sort of a, a clerical collar on. Ah, a vicar. Well, no, he didn't look like a vicar. He's got these sleeves. It was like a, a clerical collar and two white things. And then what happened? Well, he was there one minute. Do you know what he reminded me of? Because he had gaiters on, like a cardinal or a bishop, or... But he's gone now. Huh? And whereabouts was he standing? There. Oh. By, just, just by that um, netting, this side of it. And then he disappeared? Well, he couldn't have done, could he? He's obviously <laughs> there somewhere. For the final step of the experiment, Joan was hypnotized once more. This time, she was told that she would never again see the figure down by the docks, that the whole picture would be erased from her mind for good. I assure you, it was like you. We got out of the car, we walked up there. Then yeah. I said to you, I triggered off the post-hypnotic suggestion which I'd given you earlier on. And then you saw... You said you immediately just... you passed those trees. Yes. We looked at the left. That's right. And immediately I passed the trees. There was this figure. Like it was coming up on the screen, but it was so real. Yes. Did he strike you as odd though when you saw him there? Why? Very odd. Out of out of character altogether. Yes. Some from years ago, do you know what I mean? Not from now. Years ago. Oh yes. Mm. The, these sleeves. They came sort of out what, here and into 50 here. Fifty years, hundred, two hundred, oh, three hundred? Gosh. Good hundred years ago. Yes. And the This was a sort of a white collar here. And he had all this hair, and I expected the man to have a beard, but he didn't have one. He didn't? No. King no, Shaven, was he? Yes, yes, here, which didn't seem right. No. And his hair? Right. His hair was sort of grey-white and really straggly, mm. and down to about here. And what kind of a face? But all I could see was the nose. Mm. It was a hook, big hook nose, mm. um, in that flash. And, and these things... Well, sort of gators, buttons. Yes, it was sort of buttons, buttons yes. yes. Most peculiar. Yes. And then when he disappeared, then he went, how did he disappear? Like that. As though somebody had cut off a camera. Yes. For, for all the photos, there was a, a screen out there. And somebody had flashed the photograph onto the screen. Yes. Like that. Yes. Yeah. It's terrific. But made a terrific impression. Um, hmm. One that I wouldn't like to see in no. normal conditions, no. quite honest with you, no. <laughs> no. No, well, you won't see it again, I promise you that. No, I'm the same I way that quite happy about it now. I was responsible for you seeing that. I can also be responsible for your not seeing it again. Thank you very much indeed. All right. Yes, yes, it's thank you. Psychological experience. As far as Joan Morgan's concerned, the Vicar of Wapping has been exorcised. It'd be interesting to know if he's ever seen again in his accustomed haunts.